Okay, uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Paul Abrahams and I'm the Chief Communications Officer for uh, Relix. Uh, Relix, if you didn't know, is an information analytics group with a market cap of about 50 billion pounds, making it the 11th largest uh, company on the FTSE just behind GSK. It employs about 35,000 people around the world and uh, about 10 of those, about 10,000 are technologists. And we spend about 1.25 billion pounds a year on IT every year. So uh, Relix was named by Bank of America as one of the top 10 groups in the world, most likely to benefit from generative AI. Uh, it was in good company. Uh, the list included NVIDIA, Microsoft and Alphabet. And Relix was the only UK based group on the list and one of only three European companies included. Uh, Relix is no stranger to AI. For over a decade, we've been using AI technologies such as machine learning and natural language processing to help our customers make better decisions, get better results and be more productive. Relix's legal business, LexisNexis Legal and Professional, has been the leader in developing AI to the legal market, has been working with large language models, or with, sorry, with language models since 2018, and in May, it launched uh, the commercial preview of Lexus Plus AI in the US with top law firms and in-house legal departments actively engaged in its development. And more than seven and a half thousand firms have signed up to be the first to access the world's most comprehensive uh, legal generative AI platform. Uh, Lexus Plus AI features con uh, conversational search, insightful summarization, and intelligent legal drafting capabilities. And it's supported by encryption and privacy technology to keep the data secure. Today, we're gonna to discuss the hype and reality behind generative AI. And with me are two of Relix's top experts on the subject, uh, Vijay Raghavan and Jamie Buckley. So Vijay is chair of the Relix Technology Forum and chief technology officer for our risk business. Um, and prior to joining LexisNexis Risk Solutions, uh, VJ held senior positions at uh, Paragon Solutions, where he was Chief Technology Officer, and at McKesson, a Fortune 15 company, where he was Vice President of Product Development within the Imaging Solutions Group. Uh, Jamie uh, is also joining us, and he's the Chief Product Officer for LexisNexis Legal and Professional, uh, which, um, and he led the, or is leading the development of Lexis Plus uh, AI. Uh, Jamie joined us uh, in 2015, and prior to that was Vice President of Product Management at Pivotal Software, and he held global leadership uh, sorry, leadership roles at eBay and Microsoft. BJ, uh, Jamie, it's a pleasure to have you both with us. Thank you. Um, you. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, great to be okay. here. So some quick uh, house pointing, uh, housekeeping points. First of all, uh, the discussion will last about one hour and it'll be, uh, it is being recorded. And please use the Q&A function on Zoom to send your questions. And uh, I'll uh, ask them of uh, Jamie and, um, uh, and Vijay as we go along. Um, so um, on that basis, I will kick off um, PJ, let's start with some definitions. Um, a lot of us have been on a crash course since the announcement of Microsoft's investment in OpenAI and its product chat GPT last autumn or fall. Uh, can you help us by explaining terms like generative AI, large language models and foundation models? What's the difference? Sure. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think it's important to, uh, for me to set some context here. Before AI and machine learning became practically household terms, which they have over the and generative AI over the last few months, there was big data. And, and we like to say without any hint of arrogance that we were big data before it was cool, because uh, more than two decades ago, we started working with enormous amounts of data because we collected data in each of our businesses in order to extract insights and deliver those insights back to our customers. And that's where AI came in, because we needed to use AI and machine learning and deep learning techniques to operate upon the big data and the whole point of big data using AI was to generate these small actionable insights to our customers. Now that AI, those techniques, uh, which all fall under the umbrella of AI, whether, whether it's machine learning or deep learning, um, is what you might call extractive AI or predictive AI, right? The, the whole concept of taking lots of data, gathering these insights, learning from the data, and then saying, if these are the patterns, this is how you might predict an outcome going forward. Now, generative AI, where, where there's a, a 
a difference from predictive AI, extractive AI is, is that you are absorbing huge amounts of data. And that's what these large language models do. They operate upon one or more languages, usually text or code. And not only do they, they produce insights, but they are capable of generating in a very fluent manner, uh, large volumes of text, or it's not just insights, but actually paragraphs in a fairly fluent way uh, that, that could be used by lawyers that Jamie be talk, talking about. So it's much more than just extracting small actionable insights. It's actually generating pieces of text. And, and to, to your point about large language models versus foundation models, it's probably uh, at the risk of oversimplifying it. You might say that foundation models are a super set of large language models because large language models or LLMs deal with primarily text and code. Even though those definitions tend to get blurred in the media these days sometimes, uh, foundation models tend to operate upon text or voice or video or images or pictures, and not only imports all those different kinds of modalities, but also generates all those, is capable of generating all those kinds of things. Great, thanks, BJ. Uh, Jamie, I mean, we've been using extractive uh, AI for quite some time at LexisNexis. Can you give me some examples of what we've been using it for? Yeah, as, as Vijay mentioned, a lot of the work that we've been doing really over the course of the last decade um, has been using extractive AI. So, you know, some of the examples that we use in on the legal side, so search relevance, when um, when a customer types in a query, all of the you know, kind of the documents that come back, the, the answers that come back to specific questions, all of those are using extractive AI. Extractive AI is also used in, in, in Elsevier and RISC and in, in read exhibitions and a number of, of different scenarios. Great, thank you. Um, so uh, Vijay, uh, OpenAI came up with the top four capabilities for large language models and generative AI, content generation, summarization, code generation, and semantic search. Can you just explain briefly what those are and then some of the frameworks that you've developed um, uh, for Relics to uh, look at what the best use cases are uh, for, uh, for generative AI? Yeah, certainly. Uh, I mean, the, that framework is actually quite useful, the OpenAI uh, framework. Uh, we did find it a, a, little, a tad high level, so we came with slightly more granular frameworks that I'll, I'll talk about in a minute. But uh, just to touch upon those four things that you talked about, content generation is literally the generation part of generative AI, right? Uh, now, it's what the consumer has, uh, it's captured the consumer's fancy when they go to chat GPD and ask a question like, uh, write me a poem in the style of Bob Dylan, except ask her to talk about quantum mechanics, you know, that, that kind of thing. That's generative AI. In, in, in the, it, but in our context, we'd be using for much more business oriented purposes, right? Summarization is kind of the inverse where you're taking a very large, it could be a case law, it could be a very large, uh, it could be a financial report, and you're asking generative AI to boil it down into a summary in plain English for, and you can prompt it. So this whole notion of prompt engineering has come to the vernacular these days where depending on how accurate your prompt is, it can give you the summary of your choice tailored towards your needs, depending on what kind of a reader you are, right? Code generation is for a different type of audience. It's for a developer who is able to use generative AI techniques and tools to actually help the tool write chunks of code for them, or maybe serve as what they call a pair programmer, meaning it's almost like having a human being sitting by your side, breathing down your neck, telling you that you're about to commit a mistake or, or create a bug, right? So th those are the ways in which generative AI can come to play when it comes to code generation. And lastly, when it comes to semantic search, that's the notion of being able, to, th these things have been around for a while, the notion of asking a question in plain English. After all, that's what Alexa does, for example. But it takes it to the next level in terms of couching uh, a sentence or formulating a sentence but also in an interactive or conversational way and with, with lots of memory to be able to, for it to understand the context and to be able to build upon the previous question. So the, the, those are the four uh, uh, concepts within the framework. I, I think we felt that we needed something that's slightly deeper than that when it comes to our external facing, customer facing, product oriented kinds of things. We wanted a framework that compared or basically mapped a use case uh, 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 fluency versus accuracy. We've always been worried about, about accuracy, right? It's important for us to, to uh, deliver accurate results without spurious content or false positives to our customers. And where generative AI shines is fluency. It's able to generate a very fluent response, but we don't want it to do that at the expense of accuracy. So we're able to plot, it's convenient for us to plot our use cases and scenarios on this fluency accuracy axes to figure out where does it fit? So in, in the context of the scoring model, we, we require a lot of accuracy and very little fluency. 
But in the context of some of the scenarios that Jamie will talk about, you need accuracy and fluency, right? The, the second framework is, is more for code construction. And there you're mapping the risk of writing complex code or generally writing complex code versus uh, the risk and the, and the complexity, essentially. So how risky is it? Is this going to be production code or is it merely, is merely generating test cases or regression tests and those kinds of things that developers are familiar with? And lastly, the third framework is more of mapping revenue on one axis, revenue, whether it's revenue retention or, or time to revenue uh, when it comes to uh, our sales support folks or, or for the matter, our customer service folks. It's also an internal use case <clears throat> against margin and compliance, meaning if we were to use generative AI for an internal use case and we are trying to make increased customer satisfaction, how can we do that and increase our regulatory compliance posture at the same time? So these three frameworks have stood us in good state. It's early stages, but we believe they're a good way for us to view any given use case through a certain lens to separate the wheat from the chaff. Fantastic. Thanks, BJ. Um, now, there are a lot of um, uh, models that are out there, and obviously ChatGPT is just one of them. Um, we've been working with a number of them, uh, and my understanding is that we feel that there isn't one a model that uh, works for all scenarios. And do you want to just chat us through that? Certainly. Uh, as you ask me, Paul, right? Uh, yes. But you mean, yeah. 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 So uh, um, the common theme across the Relix divisions is that when it comes to a usage of AI, we don't go around looking for solutions to problems uh, that don't exist, right? So we, we, uh, we, uh, we, we try to figure out what the right tool is for a given problem. And that's a great way to figure out um, exactly which tool to use, whether it's in the context of generative AI or a machine learning or deep learning tool. Uh, even before generative AI came along, we used a plethora of machine learning techniques for any given set of problems. And it wasn't always necessarily true that the most complex and the most newfangled technique was the right one to use to solve a given problem. And, and, and so it goes for generative AI. So if you just look at uh, GPT-3, 3.5, which is one family of LLMs within OpenAI, that has a range of uh, models uh, starting from Ada to Da Vinci and so on. And, and you go from um, a model, an LLM that can deal with uh, a tremendous amount of fluency, but it's cheaper and it's faster, versus, versus one that's more expensive, maybe much more fluent, much more accurate, uh, and it's slower, right? So uh, depending upon exactly what the scenario is and the use cases that we're dealing with, we can pick and choose which model to use. So it's not as though there's a one, that's, that's a, to your point about, it's not a one size fits all solution. There's a range of tools, and further, this is a pretty young uh, phenomenon, right? It's a, it's a very, it, it, it captured our, our fancy. Uh, it's been around for a few years uh, in, the, in the in the context of larger companies, but in terms of the democratization, if you want to call it that, of these tools, uh, we, we're in the nascent stages of these tools becoming available, and they're going to leapfrog each other. So we don't necessarily want to partner with just one vendor or one tool. We're going to see which tool makes sense for a given situation. Jimmy, was that? true in when you were generate when you were putting together Lexus plus AI? Yeah, absolutely. So there's yeah, as Vijay mentioned, some of the models are better suited for different use cases. And there's there's some other considerations as well. And so for for legal use cases, it's pretty clear that chat GPT by itself isn't going to work. It it for very simple use cases, it could often work out of the box, but for most of the use cases that our customers deal with every day, it's just not quite accurate enough right out of the box. And so one of the other considerations is, is um, different models have uh, give you different opportunities to improve the output. And so there's a lot that we do for Lexus plus AI to work to, to improve that output. And so that includes bringing our legal editors into the loop to help to train the model. Also connecting the large language model to our search engine. So that's how we reduce hallucinations. So you, you, know, you read about hallucinations all the time with LLMs where where it will often say, okay, since it's it's kind of geared towards fluency, it said it would be really good to have a citation here, but it just doesn't doesn't have that information in its you know in its index. And so we connect the large language model with our search engine to reduce hallucinations, and that's really important. Um, and then also another consideration for us is on the privacy side. Now, obviously, it's incredibly important that anyone who's who's using these models that their data is protected. So, for example, when when our customers are, are using Lexus Plus AI, it's extremely important that none of their information bleeds into other sessions from other customers. It's also very important that as a company that our IP is protected as well. 
And so that's a, it's a, just a non-starter because there are, you know, there are, there are some models that you can work with where the data is used to train other models. Obviously, we, we don't work with that approach. It's really important for us to use only models where, where the data is highly protected, where it's accessed through kind of world-class cloud providers, you know, specifically through, through Microsoft, Azure, and through Amazon AWS, where, where the data is contractually protected. So, so you mentioned hallucinations. Uh, there was uh, a rather infamous case in New York last month where two rather hapless uh, lawyers who will probably make, leave them nameless used chat GPT to put together a pleading and chat GPT just made stuff up. Uh, the, the lawyers did check the citations uh, and they did that by asking chat GPT if the citations could be found in LexisNexis and GPT, chat GPT then lied again so that they were. Uh, and the judge wasn't very amused and ended up finding them both $5,000 and they lost their case. Can, can you just go in a little bit, little bit more detail about you know, how we use the 144 billion documents we've got to, uh, to make sure that uh, we minimize hallucinations as far as is possible? Yeah, you know, the, the problem with ChatGPT, so it's, you know, it's trained on you know, trillions of documents uh, across the web, all publicly available. And the, the technology is incredible. Like it's absolutely incredible what it can do, but it's it's really designed to come up with logical, coherent sentences, answers to questions. And one thing you'll notice, like you have very few people complaining that the answer that's provided, it's not grammatically correct, or there are you know spelling mistakes. You you don't really hear see or hear much about that. It does happen from time to time, but so um, but that's kind of, that's what it's geared toward. It's not you know it's not really focused on providing accurate answers all the time. And uh, uh, that technology is getting better over time, but it's it's obviously not quite there yet. And so it, there's a real danger to just using chat GPT out of the box for any complex scenario. So for us, so, so we take, so again, we take a, a multi-model approach, including GPT and, and other models, but we connect them. There's, there's a couple things that, you know, that we do even before connecting to our search engine. Um, but in, in terms of improving the output, so we have a number of use cases for Lexus Plus AI. And the, the primary ones that we focus on are around conversational search. So these are for uh, complex legal research questions. Also document drafting, where you could both analyze a document, a written legal document, and create a draft of a document right from a simple prompt, which is really an incredible use case that wasn't even possible before generative AI. And then the third one is around summarization, where we, uh, a lot of our case law documents are quite long, and it's really useful to be able to summarize either a single document or multiple documents together. So anyway, so within those, those use cases, we have a lot of sub-use cases, and then our legal experts help to train the model to improve the quality of the output on those use cases. Now, when, when the LLMs are created, they are general purpose LLMs, the ones that, that you see in the market. And we don't we don't care about scenarios like you know tell me the the top restaurants in Paris. So it's it we're able just to focus on the legal scenarios. So the of the ones that I talked about, and then we'll be expanding that over time. So we have our legal experts help to fine tune the the data to make sure it's it's a technical process called called fine tuning. And you'll read about it's called reinforcement learning with human feedback, which is where we have the humans, which is our legal experts help to improve the model and it applies reinforcement learning onto that. So that's that's kind of one step. The next one is we, we integrate it with our search engine. So a customer will type in a legal question and we will reformulate that question within Lexis plus AI. We will issue the, the query into our search engine and then document. So our search engine, right? I mentioned it uses extractive AI for years you know, to, to return the best documents. That will return a number of relevant documents back to the large language model. And then the model will parse those documents. And it, sometimes you'll have a loop. Sometimes it's just one query against our search engine. Sometimes it's multiple. But at the end of the day, there's tight integration between our content and the large language model so that when the answer is provided back to our customer, you'll get a clear answer to the question. And then you will also get specific citations so a list of the documents where that answer came from, which you don't get right now out of the box with ChatGPT, which is another problem for our customers because they want to be able to verify that the answer is correct. So and you could just click on those documents and then it, you could you know you could view the case law documents or other types of content sets, for example. 
it's all right there in the answer. So, so uh, if I summarize that, um, the combination of the large data sets that we have combined with the, the, this new tech, emerging technology, and then our deep customer understanding provides a very powerful combination which will provide value for our customers. Yeah, that's exactly right. You know, our, our content set is incredibly deep. You know, we have we have over 150 billion documents in our index right now. And so being able to apply all of the great technology that large language models provide with our deep content sets, with our human experts, right, with a search engine integration, all of that helps to provide great answers for our customers. Great, thank you. Um, one of the nice things about the drafting model, uh, uh, which you've done some demos on, is that there aren't enough aggressive lawyers in the world and you can actually get it to draft more aggressive letters if you think your letter isn't aggressive enough. Uh, which you can I also think. do less aggressive letters if you want. So it's, oh, sorry, so it's, that, yes. it's very customizable. <laughs> okay, you didn't demonstrate that bit. Um, okay, so B BJ, uh, if we take a step back, um, where do you see the, the, the benefits uh, uh, um, accruing from these large language models and foundation models? Well, I, I think the sky's the limit. I think the opportunities are tremendous. Uh, I mean, there is an extraordinary amount of hype, that is true, but the hype in this case is well-founded uh, because when you look at uh, what GPT-4 is capable of, uh, capable of these days, and when you look at the incredible pace of change uh, and how quickly new generations of technology are being released, that, that tells us that the opportunity is uh, constrained only by imagination. Uh, so when we look across the Relix portfolio companies, uh, certainly I can speak for risk, but, but in multiple industries, even though, even when you look at the scenarios where uh, our customers are engaging with us via machine to machine, point to point uh, transactions. We still see scenarios where it might make it would make sense for us to offer our customers an expand an expanded uh, experience, right? Uh, so if you look at uh, something like our threat metrics offering, it is a classic machine to machine kind of interaction. But our customers also want to see what the patterns of transactions are for a given financial institution in a given region in a given geography geography for a given type of product offering. Uh, from our customer to their consumers. So, uh, like I said, I think I think the sky's the limit. And, and when I look across Elsevier and and legal, of course, uh, which Jamie's already talked about, there are so many different scenarios, both for external product and customer facing kinds of use cases, as well as internal use cases. Uh, healthcare is a very good example of where we can see, uh, just like I talked about pair programming, uh, the notion of having a virtual attending physician uh, sitting on a shoulder and helping the diagnosing physician uh, or a clinician. That's a, a great example of where generative AI can help us. J Jamie, what are your thoughts on this? Completely agree. There's there's so much opportunity, you know, so when, you know, as you mentioned earlier, we've been using AI for, you know, for over a decade, we've been using language models kind of starting with open source BERT from I think 2018 and then large language models we've been using really since they came out. So we have we have a number of, of features right now using GPT-3, GPT-3.5 um, in our product in Lexus Plus, which is our, our flagship legal research product. But with Generative AI, with, with ChatGPT launched in GPT-4, that I mean, it's really increased the, the quality of the output and then the, you know, the potential use cases are, are really tremendous. And so again, when you, know, when you focus the model output on just a specific domain, and you apply our leading content set, for example, and leading content sets that we have across Relex and human experts. We have a number of human, we have a lot of human experts on the legal side, similarly in, in other divisions, and then integrate that together. It's, um, it, it's really incredible and the sky's the limit. Great. Um, just a reminder for any of the participants, if you want to ask any questions, do use the Q&A um, uh, function and I will ask them for you. Um, so uh, with all of this fantastic opportunity, um, uh, th there are also some dangers involved in this and the ability to um, uh, generate fake images or voices or um, video as well as text uh, cre also creates all sorts of, uh, all sorts of dangers. And that it sort of reinforces the need to have trusted sources of information. So how, how do you think Jamie, that you know this is going to play out, where the ability to generate nonsense is the barriers to generating nonsense are sort of collapsing. Yeah, it, you know it's incredibly important, I think, to have trusted sources of information. 
And so otherwise you're just, it's really not, if it, is it, is it accurate or not? Is it true or not? It's just, it's just really not clear. And so there's, you know, there's a few different things that, you know, I talked about some of the things that we're doing to focus on, on the legal side, but you see in, you know, in other industries that there's, you know, there are deep fakes that are created, um, there are video, there's, you know, there's kind of, there's sometimes there's hallucination, right, that, that you see across, there's, there's a number of issues, and then you also see that there's, okay, like in education, right, sometimes you will, you'll use, a, um, students will use chat GPT to kind of answer questions, and then there are other companies, some open source models to try to identify AI responses, right, so those are out there. And then there are also solutions that try to counter the, you know, the, the solutions that try to identify. So that that's really an, an arms race ultimately. And then that will just continue over time. And one of the problems is if you don't really know the provenance of the answer, it's just it's just a continual arms race. So that's why why for us, you know, we're focused on on integrating with with our core content, like human experts, like search integration, et cetera, to make sure that the answers that we provide are are as accurate as physically possible. And we will continue to, to take advantage of technologies and LLMs, take advantage of advancements in our own search and then the connections between them to try to make sure that the answers we provide are as accurate as possible to reduce some of the issues that you read about every day. Vijay, do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, uh, to, to some extent, this, this is not a new phenomenon, uh, meaning even if you rewind a few months ago, going back to the early days of machine learning and and what we do within LexisNexis Risk Solutions, uh, we've always looked at uh, a couple of metrics when it comes to the accuracy of our, uh, and the comprehensiveness of our data and our solutions to our customers. And we use these metrics called precision and recall, right? Those are important terms because what you want is a very precise answer without any spurious data that's part of it. Uh, you don't want false positives. You want very high recall because you want the answer to be as comprehensive as possible. When you have, when you try to uh, increase your recall at the expense of precision, you get spurious answers, which is analogous to what you see as hallucinations in the generative AI world, right? So again, when Jamie is talking about fluency and accuracy and, and the fact that uh, you know you, you can get a really well crafted uh, answer in whatever language you choose, the fact that it's fluent may mean that it is compromised on the accuracy. And to his point about provenance of the data. If you've scraped Facebook and TikTok and LinkedIn and Instagram and all kinds of sources where there's as much garbage as there is valuable data, then yeah, you might know the provenance of those things, but the, the quality of the data is suspect, right? And, and so th that's where hallucinations come in. So this all ties into our responsible use of data. So when you talk about responsible ethics in, in AI, what we're really talking about is to make sure the provenance of the data is it's sacrosanct. We know exactly where it's come from, and we're using the data in a manner that it's best suited for our customers to help their customers. Great. Uh, it's all about plausibility. I mean, the, very often ChatGPT comes up with stuff which looks very plausible, but um, is, is doubtful. Um, so we'll come to the, the impact on the legal profession in a moment, but uh, Vijay, what are your thoughts? I mean, which sectors do you see being most benefiting or impacted by, um, by generative AI? Oh, uh, you know, it's hard for me to rank them, but uh, I, I can't see any sector not being impacted. Uh, uh, so uh, obviously the legal sector that James been talking about, I think the financial services industry that we cater to within uh, risk solutions uh, is gonna see a lot of benefits from generative AI. Uh, healthcare, I think is another great example of industry that could be uh, that could be assisted enormously by, enormously by generative AI. Uh, I, I think uh, even the insurance industry that is a part of a, a uh, one of our verticals, uh, primary verticals, in, in, within LexisNexis Risk Solutions, I, I think I see a lot of scope when you talk when you when you consider the the typical interaction between a consumer and an insurance company. There is a lot of scope for that to be optimized. So whether it's the insurance company thinking of it or us giving them ideas about how to to grease the skids in those in those interactions, so to speak, I think there's a lot of upside potential there. Okay, and turning to the legal industry, Jamie. Go. What do you think is going to happen? I think overall, so number one, you know, the opportunity is incredible. So, you know, the use cases that I talked about around complex legal research, document drafting, summarization, lawyers are doing that today right now. They're just, you know, they're just using the tools that are available to them. And now there's, you know, there, there's even more advanced tools that are going to be available to them to do that. 
So it will end up reducing a lot of the drudge work that they have to deal with every day, which, which they really appreciate. And we've had, you know, we, we obviously we talk to our customers all the time. We talk to lawyers all over the world. Those are some of the core use cases that they've identified ones where they think generative AI can help. You know, we had a, a really broad survey that was, it started in the US a few months ago where we, we surveyed uh, over 4,000 lawyers, law school students, and consumers. And we're doing similar surveys all around the world. And when we did that, you know, 39% of lawyers at the time, this was in March, 39% of lawyers thought that generative AI was transformational for legal. And that number just increases over time. You know, that was, it was, that was kind of early days of generative AI, which is, but it's only, you know, four months ago. And so it's, it's incredible. So tons of, tons of opportunity for, for legal. You know, one question that, that we often get was, what does that mean to, uh, to jobs, right? And so the way that we see all of this is that this will help to remove the drudge work. You know, it will not replace lawyers. It's, it's extremely important for lawyers to be vetting all of this information. We are not practicing law, right? Our customers are practicing law. And so we're out there to help them as much as possible. And there's been a lot of adv technology advancements over time when, you know, the question will come up, you know, what happens to, you know, to the legal industry, what happens to lawyers. And for every single advance that we've seen, even starting from, you know, we pioneered online legal, legal research way back in the day, and then even to the start of machine learning, and there's been tons of advancements ever since, and this is the latest one, we've only seen the number of lawyers increase over time, right? And so, it's really important that lawyers take advantage of these tools though, because I, th I think you'll see a clear difference between lawyers that are using generative AI, just like the ones that have been using extractive AI versus ones that, that don't use it. It's, it's terribly important for, you know, for, from in our industry that lawyers are taking advantage of, of tools that are available to them. So, but if I'm able to draft something using generative AI in a matter of moments, whereas previously it might have taken me an hour. What does that do to kind of the billable hour, and, you know, which is kind of the, the, the fundamental basis of the law firm? There's still, yeah, there's still certainly work that has to be done on the legal side. Now, you'll have an initial draft and then you'll, you'll often have to edit it. That will get, get better over time. Mm -hmm. And so it also enables though the lawyer to work on some higher value tasks with customers. So it's, it's unlikely that the billable hour would would go away. I, you know, I think that the nature of of maybe the communication and and maybe how the the work actually happens behind the scenes, some of that might might change over time. Like I said, it will it will generally elevate the work that lawyers do and remove some of the drudge work. But it it's most likely not going to remove the or reduce the billable hour concept. Okay, so um, uh, in in terms of uh, law firms. Uh, uh, we've seen Alan Overy with Harvey. Um, you know, do you think you know law firms should be buying or partnering or building their own uh, own AI? I think number one, it, it, it's really important for law firms to to get educated on what's out there. Just there's there's a lot of noise, and um, and that's that's number one is for them to get educated and. And it, it really depends on, on the law firm. Now, you know, obviously we would prefer that, you know, that lawyers partner with us. I think that, you know, that that's a real strategic advantage, but, but there are, you know, there are some larger law firms that say they have their own applications that they would like to build, but they would like to do it with a legally trained model. And so we get a lot of customer requests saying that um, they would like to use the LLM that we're working on integrated with their content so that either we can we can showcase that within a product or that they could build products around that. So like, for example, um, we have just before generative AI, we offer a lot of our content available within APIs. It's protected APIs that a number of larger law firms are using to create their own applications. And that's really valuable for them because they could completely customize it to their own firm's needs. And so it'll, it'll ultimately depend on, on the use cases and and the size of the customer. But I think in most cases, custom, um, law firms are going to be best suited by partnering with, um, you know, with a company that's, that's building kind of great generative AI solutions. And we, we feel great about Lexus plus AI. So, you know, we would prefer that. Um, but there, like I said, there's also a number of larger law firms that will want 
direct integration into the LM or into the content that we have so that they could build applications on their own. And of course, we've spent over a billion dollars building our stack uh, and continue to invest hundreds of millions of dollars every year uh, on, on product development. And that's something that's quite difficult for a, a law firm for whom it's not a core competency to replicate. Yeah, it's, I mean, so a law firm is often not, they're not going to build a competitive product, you know, that they'll often use, let's say, their leverage our content or our LLM to kind of supplement their, and this is, this is something that, you know, that, that they do, that they do fairly often. Um, now it's interesting, you know, the points you bring up are interesting when you look at startups, because it's great to see a lot of innovation in legal tech, you know, that the problem, though, is a lot of the startups, they just don't have the deep content sets that we have. Like I mentioned, over 150 billion documents in our index. And so, and that's vetted, and that's just kind of raw documents. So then we apply a lot of enrichment on top of those documents. There are a number of features that we that we build on top of those. And and some of those are, are done through SMEs. A lot of it is done through extractive AI. We've been we've been supplementing our content for the last 10 years using over 10 years using extractive AI techniques. And then now we're we're supplementing our content using generative AI techniques behind the scenes as well. So that's that's really hard for a legal startup to to try to get to just because they don't have the deep content set, they don't have the legal experts, and um, and often you know the size is a bit limited. And and again, all of this stuff has to be done in a way that protects data. You know, sometimes a, a legal tech startup will try to get something out quickly and. And maybe it's not done in a way that that will protect data as, as much as our customers need. And so for us, everything that we build has privacy by design built into it to make sure that our customer data is secure. PJ, okay. we'll be back to it in a moment. I'm going to ask one more LexisNexis legal uh, question. Sure. So uh, I know we don't tend to talk about our, um, our competitors, but um, I'm going to break the rule here. So uh, Thomson Reuters spent $650 million on an AI organization with less than 100 employees and nominal revenues. Um, so is LexisNexis planning to splurge out on uh, acquisitions? Yeah, so our general, so generative AI, we talked a lot about how strategically important generative AI, the huge opportunity. So when, um, as I mentioned, we've been using GPT for, you know, for a while since uh, we've been using language models since 2018, we've been using large language models for over a year, you know, GPT-3 and, and now 3.5 and then now 4 is, is right kind of recently launched. And then chat GPT is, like I said, a kind of incredible, we're incorporating that and, and multi-model support. So, so it's important for us to, you know, to continue doing that. Now, as over time, we've been developing all of this generative AI capabilities organically within the team. We have over 100 data scientists within the company. We have hundreds and hundreds of, of uh, machine learning engineers within the company. And this is a lot of this done was, was through either extractive early back in the day. And then as, um, as language models and large language models has come out, we've developed a lot of expertise in those, which is incredibly important. Now for us, our, our preference is to build this up organically because we feel like generative AI is so strategically important to us as a company that it's incredibly important that we build up this capability internally, which is what we have been doing. And so Lexus Plus AI, we build organically. We have, we, you know, we partner with, with multiple creators of different models. And then I mentioned our human experts. And so that's all done organically. Now that said, we are always on the lookout for amazing legal tech startups. There's a lot of great innovation that's happening in the legal industry. And we were always on the lookout. And we, you know, there's a, there's a small number of legal tech companies that are using Generative AI today. And that number is just exploding over time. So we are constantly on the lookout. We are, we are looking at, at every single legal tech startup that's out there, Generative AI or not Generative AI, but, um, but our focus is to build the, the capabilities internally but if there's an incredible startup that, you know, that, that comes across our radar that's doing some really innovative things and in generative AI that we think could, you know, could really help our, our customers, then absolutely we will, we will go after that opportunity. I, I, I remember when we purchased Lex Machina, um, which is a Silicon Valley um, uh, company, uh, probably eight years ago now, and um, they'd been kind of struggling along because they just didn't have the data and we were able to provide them with 
the data for each of the verticals and practice areas they wanted. And that's been a huge success and they just wouldn't be able to do that without our data. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Yeah, that's in my backyard. So, you know, I live in, in Silicon Valley and so talk to the Lex Machina folks quite often. And, and you know, they, they had a, a really innovative product, but as you mentioned, they were, they were really limited by the content that they had available. And they were also limited by the human experts that they had to, you know, to rate the quality of, of the content and, and the approaches that they were taking. A lot of the, the innovative approaches they were taking to enrich the content. So yeah. when when you when you supplement that with our you know our content and legal experts you know you could really help to scale the business which is exactly what what they've done. Great. So um, so VJ, I um, actually spent the weekend seeing the new Mission Impossible movie, and uh, you'll be glad to know that AI plays a major role. In fact, the antagonist in the movie to Tom Cruise is an AI called the Entity, which is about to destroy the world. We don't know whether it does or not because it's only part one. Um, but Hollywood's got a lot to answer for between Minority Report and the Terminator movies. Uh, I'm wondering, you know, what should we actually be worried about with AI? Well, uh, yeah, I, I tend not to worry about, you know, the, the singularity or, you know, the, the things that might cause the complete meltdown of civilization. Uh, yeah, I, I guess uh, there are some very bright people. Do you want to explain what the singularity is? Oh, it's basically that the, the final inevitable conclusion of humanity when AI is so all-knowing and all-powerful that it basically takes over and completely destroys uh, humanity as we know it. Right? Good to know. Uh, I, I tend not to worry about that. I, I think that the things to worry about more are the ground realities of, uh, you know, it, again, it comes back to the, the responsible use of AI, right? So it, there's there's ways it is important for regulations to, to be in place, right? We often, sometimes we look at regulations with a jaundiced eye, but uh, when we talk about startups or upstarts uh, who jump into the fray in various industries, including ours, it's possible to come in with a half-baked solution with all kinds of promises. And where we come in is the wealth of domain expertise we have, the data that we have, and how to use the data in a responsible way so that we don't get our customers in trouble or we help them not get get, get, them, into, get them in trouble, right? So I think uh, uh, the key point there is as, as the barrier to entry is being lowered for these kinds of solutions for various entities to come in and build solutions using these tools, there still need to be, there, there still needs to be a set of checkpoints, whether it's self-imposed barriers, which we do a pretty good job of, or the regulate, regulators to say, here's a set of ground rules that people have to play by in order to make sure that we protect ourselves and protect, protect our customers and industry and consumers. All right, thanks, BJ. I just a reminder, if you've got any questions, do pop them in the Q&A function. Uh, we haven't got any yet, so um, uh, you'll be at the top of the queue. Uh, Jamie, are you worried about the singularity? Yeah, it, it's really hard to predict what's going to happen. I don't know where years at. Like when I think about the next, you know, five years, ten years, you know, it's not, it's not really something that that's top of mind. You know, for me, when I when I think about generative AI, it's it's really more about all of the amazing opportunities that are out there. You know, for for both customers of legal industry and and outside. Now, you know, that said, it is really important that it's regulated as as much as makes sense so as vijay mentioned we welcome regulation you know you you know you read about a number of different countries that you know that are are either looking into it or starting to regulate or or have already taken some actions to do that which i think is really important also scrutinizing the you know the various um, creators of of large language models and and their approaches and and kind of what they're doing i think that's that's all really valuable and and obviously we will we will comply with with all of regulations we're in you know, across relics, we're we're in so many different countries around the world. So we will we will comply with with all of that. But I, I think all of that regulation will will certainly help to uh, you know for folks to to feel more more comfortable you know in a kind of an AI future. Great. Now you you both mentioned regulation, uh, and I know that the uh, European Commission is looking uh, actively at this at this area. Is that is there a danger that um, the, the European Union slightly misses out on the benefits from generative AI by being over enthusiastic on its um, on its regulation. Uh, BJ. Yeah, sorry. I, I think there always is that risk to some extent, uh, and not just in the European Union. Uh, I, I see we see evidence of that in pockets in the in the US as well. 
and other jurisdictions. And I think the key to that is to maintain a healthy dialogue with regulators, which I think we've done a pretty good job of, meaning we get to see pending legislation or draft legislation before it actually gets baked. Uh, and we're often asked to give our input um, to voice our opinion as to whether something, whether a certain clause or a certain set of regulations, proposed regulations are a little too heavy handed or not. Uh, of course, our opinion is one among many. Uh, and so it's not like our, our voice is the only voice that counts, but it still matters that we're being asked for our opinion. And it's in all likelihood, people in our industry, be it our competitors or partners, they probably feel the same way as we do, right? And so the, there is this balance between being creating those appropriate barriers or hurdles that I talked about versus being too heavy handed. And I think the important thing is we have the dialogue on an ongoing basis with regulators. Jamie? Yeah, hundred percent agree. You know, there's there's certainly that you know the benefits to society around regulation across the world, and I, I think that you know that ultimately is happening. And you, like I said, you you see different countries kind of taking different approaches here. It, it's also really important for us to stay on top of the just in, in our business. It's really important for us to stay on top of all of that regulation because what's going to happen is you know as this comes down they're asked, you know, often, you know, companies or, you know, kind of law firms will be asked these questions around what does this mean for me? And for me, meaning kind of, you know, company X, let's say. And it's important for us to provide solutions for our customers that make it really clear what the regulation means to them and, and take advantage of that. So that that's something that we're keeping a, a really, really close eye on, as we do with, with all regulation. But, but we anticipate that there's just going to be a lot more of regulation and generative AI over time. Right. Now, obviously, you mentioned regulation and then also self-regulation. Um, Redux um, last year um, um, published its uh, responsible AI principles. Do, Jamie, do you want to just talk through how that works and how we uh, how we try to behave ethically? Yeah, let me let me talk about a specific instance, you know, within within legal. And then maybe Vijay could talk about the responsible AI uh, principles just kind of more generically. But for us, you know, I talked a little bit about, about privacy by design, and it's incredibly important that it's it's explainable. You know, one of the, the principles is that you know everything that we do is, is we could explain kind of how it's you know how it's actually working and so and, and understand how it's working. And so and so for us, that, that's a really important thing and making sure that the data is all protected. And so part of, you know, part of the responsibility AI principles is to make sure that, that our customer data is protected, that kind of relx data is protected. And so that's, that's something it's, you know, it's not a, you know, Vijay talked about recall and precision, and, and sometimes there's a trade-off for us, like there's no, across relx there's no trade-off for privacy. <laughs> so, you know, so privacy, it's built, it has to be built into all the applications. And so that's something that that's critically important to everything we do is, and it is an important responsible AI principle. And Vijay, we, we've spoken uh, together in the past about bias and, you know, real world bias and uh, content bias and then AI bias. Do, do you want to just explain that a little bit? Yeah, uh, the term bias is a little bit misunderstood in the context of AI, because uh, when we talk about it in in, in, uh, in uh, conventional terms, we think of racial bias and those kinds of things. So bias inherently has a negative connotation. When it comes to data and the app applications of AI operating upon the data, there is always bias in the data. In fact, the whole concept of machine learning and being able to separate uh, chunks of data from other chunks of data and trying to observe patterns is based on inherent bias within the data. And I use the term bias in a very neutral way, right? The data is biased or skewed in certain ways, which allows machine learning to detect patterns within the data. Uh, so I, I think when it comes to our responsible AI principles that GM touched upon, one, a, a couple of them are important. One is we strive to avoid creating or reinforcing unfair bias. And the term unfair bias is what's, uh, what's critical there. Because like I said, there's always bias in the data, but if you were to perpetuate un unfair bias by incorporating uh, negative stereotypes about race or gender, whatever it might be, into the solutions we provide to our customers, that is actually reinforcing unfair bias. And what we try to do with the solutions is to suppress unfair bias, even as we detect the bias that's inherent within the data. Uh, and, and, and another principle which goes hand in hand with, with what I just talked about is, we create accountability through human oversight. So yes, a machine learning algorithm or a deep learning algorithm might detect the bias and patterns in the data, and surface certain insights. 
but we can't just let it have it and come up with an answer without some level of human oversight. To Jamie's point about lawyers, it's not about replacing a lawyer, it's about augmenting the productivity of a lawyer. And the same way, we want in every sphere of what we do, in all our verticals across Relics, we want to augment our customers' ability to make decisions and to, and to reach conclusions using AI techniques, ethically. Thanks, BJ. Um, so uh, we finally got a question. Uh, feel free to post any any additional ones. Um, so the question is, you talk about removing the drudge work for lawyers and customers. What about improving internal efficiencies? How does a FTSE 100 group like Relex um, uh, use Gen AI to, uh, generative AI to improve internal efficiencies? Jamie, do you want to kick off on that? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I think there's, you know, there's a lot of opportunities to improve um, productivity internally across the company. I, you know, I'll talk about just a few things that, that we're doing within, within legal. And I know that we have, we have regular discussions with, with Vijay and with the other divisions as well on, on kind of sharing best practices and, and in some cases code. So, you know, one is, is on the engineering side, you know, Vijay talked about using generative AI in a, again, in an IP safe way for to help our engineers code and debug. That's a, you know, there could be some huge productivity gains there. Um, there's also ones around make just making LLMs available within within the company in a protected way. So kind of not accessing through OpenAI directly, for example, but but accessing an LLM in a protected way in a protected environment. And that's something that you know that that we're exposing kind of to our internal employees with kind of some clear guidelines. And so that so that way they can use it for their day-to-day -day work, but it's done in a way where the data is protected. It doesn't bleed into other sessions. It's not used to train the model, et cetera. So that, and just, just having that available helps a lot of different roles. Like, like for example, you know, marketing folks, you know, writing compelling marketing copy, right? Or, um, or let's say if uh, our editorial folks, you know, there's a lot of work that we do around content enrichment. And in, in some cases, we're going to have customized tools like to help them with that enrichment using generative AI, and which we're already building. But in some cases, just in their day-to-day -day work, they just want to be able to access a, uh, a legally trained uh, generative AI model in a way where the data is protected. And so, and so that's you know we're exposing that to them as well. Another thing that we're doing is pointing. Just I talked about our in our external application Lexus Plus AI we integrate the LLM with our content, with our externally available content. Now there's a lot there's a lot that we can do to integrate an LLM with internally available content. Like for example, our HR policies. So, you know, so let's say there's a, a manager in the company and they have an employee that's moving, let's say from the UK to the US. And they have a question, you know, how does the parental leave policy differ between the UK and the US? And it seems like a, it's a simple question to a human who kind of knows that answer. But if you think about what you have to do, you have to make sure that the policies are number one, kind of well crafted, and that the LLM is kind of is 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 pointing to the right policy. You have to identify the right policy documents. You have to parse the document to to work out exactly what they're asking for. And then you have to compare it, and that's that's a perfect kind of question for an LLM pointed against an internal knowledge base, and you could. You could think about any other internal knowledge base that a company might have around, or it could be like for a law firm might have uh, internal knowledge bases around, you know, how to interact with customers or, or different style guides for writing legal documents or a kind of a, a general corporation might have an internal knowledge base on kind of technical best practices, or I mentioned HR knowledge bases. And so there's, there's a tremendous number of, of internal applications. So with us, for us internally, we've, you know, we work with each of our leaders and they all brainstormed a number of, of ways where generative AI could, could help internally. And then we've had internal sessions with our leadership team to help to prioritize some of the ones that we want to focus on centrally. So, so just like we're going after generative AI in, in a really big way for our external products, there's, there's a ton of opportunity within, um, within Relics as well. Thanks, Jamie. I'm, I'm just going to give a plug to our... Um and media channel perspectives, which is on the website. Uh, we produce about 50 um, articles a, a year, long form, long form journalism. And we've started using generative AI to create the headlines and provide summaries for Twitter. And uh, it's actually pretty good at that, I have to say. Um, Vijay, um, internal efficiencies. Yeah, I, I think your, to your point about semantic search that you asked at the very top of the conversation, that's exactly, that dovetails with what Jamie was talking about. 
uh, you talked about m and as well. We've all been, I'm sure most of us have been, we've certainly been new employees at one point or the other in, a, in our respective companies. Um, we've acquired companies or we've been acquired. And uh, it's quite daunting for a new employee or a person who's just been acquired into a much larger company to figure out where to start and who's on first and whom do I talk to for what. So right there, there's an opportunity for internal efficiencies to just give a jump start to a new employee, either uh, in their company or in a new department who switch jobs or roles to be able to get them more productive as quickly as possible. So I think that's a tremendous use case. And it's it's not just about uh, cost reduction, obviously cost reduction and cost avoidance are part of it, but it's also things like employee morale. Th those are soft things, but th these are the kinds of things that will impact employee retention in a very positive way. I'm convinced of that. Great. DJ, uh, Jamie, time is up. Thank you very much uh, for your time. I feel much better educated on generative AI. And I'm not so worried about the singularity as I was before, uh, which is probably a good thing. Uh, and I think the next Mission Impossible would be, we have to wait till next year for the uh, for the part two, so we'll have to find out whether the world comes to an end or not. Uh, thank you very much for your time. And um, if any of you have got any follow-up questions, feel free to uh, contact me at paul.abrahams at relics.com. And um, we're happy to answer your generative AI uh, large language model questions that you may have. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.